Welcome back, everybody, to the Canadian Rec. This is Jamie Gray. This pod, we welcome Rugby Canada's men's coaches, Kingsley Jones and Rob Halley. Uh, it's going to be a great chat, good rugby conversation all the way around. Make sure you stick with us. First off, I'd like to thank any first-time listeners. Uh, this is a pod about rugby uh, in Canada in particular. Get a little bit of international flavor every once in a while. It's a platform where our rugby personalities, be it players, past and present, or future, coaches, admin, get to actually share their story voice their opinions on things and I guess tell us their origin and how they get to uh, the top echelons of rugby in Canada. Uh, we've got a lot of fine athletes in this country and it's a it's a great platform for them to spread their news. Uh, there's always a little bit of rugby news played in there. Uh, sometimes there's a gray area which is sometimes controversial stuff. Anyway really uh, hope you enjoy this and we hope you come back for more and you want to know where to find things or what to do here you, you can contact us. We're on uh, the Twitter at Canadian Ruck. Instagram, the underscore Canadian underscore Ruck, Facebook at the Canadian Ruck, and our email is the Canadian Ruck at gmail.com. When you're doing that, you're, you're following us on the social media, which is great, but just as importantly, you're going to watch us on YouTube where you can follow and subscribe. You're going to listen to us on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, or CastBox where you can follow and subscribe as well. Make sure you're sharing as well. Make sure you're passing these messages around so that other people get a chance to hear these stories. And lastly, we're, on, we're online at thecanadianrock.weebly.com. It's a great place to uh, find all past content, information about the pod and guests. It's a great place for any starter, for anybody just curious as to what pods we have up. And now uh, let's take a look at some rugby news. It's an uh, interesting week in the world of rugby. Uh, Six Nations happening right now. Two matches uh, going on this weekend. It's Friday afternoon as I record this here in New Brunswick, Canada. And... Uh, we did our poll, we did our Instagram poll, we did our Twitter poll. On Twitter, 80% chose Wales over England for the victory, uh, me included in that one. And uh, also on Twitter, 87% had has Ireland over Italy. On Instagram, a little bit lower, uh, still Wales over England at a 75% uh, guess rate. And for Ireland over Italy, it jumped up to a little bit higher to 90%. Saying all that, though, we, as we know, France and Scotland's game has been postponed due to COVID issues. Is this turning into a logistical nightmare for the Six Nation? Is a derailing momentum of the Six Nation? Teams are in bubbles. If someone breaks a bubble, should the Scots be awarded the win because that's apparently what happened with France? Or does the game, should it just get tacked on to the end of the competition, which is, I believe, what is happening? I'm not the expert here, but I do know COVID sucks. Uh, as most of you, or hopefully all of you, would attest to. COVID has thrown havoc into a lot of areas of the world. And COVID doesn't care about Six Nations. It doesn't care about rugby. It doesn't care about any other sporting event. So my thoughts on this, relax. Play the game when it's safe. Play the game when the players are out of quarantine so that you're not spreading more of this disease. Super rugby action. Can anybody find a stream? Man. New Zealand and Australia are both in full game mode and be nice to see some of those or all of those fixtures actually. In New Zealand, uh, overnight, the Crusaders doubled up on the Highlanders 26-13 in the opener. Um, Crusaders fan, judge me if you would like. And uh, overnight tonight, the, the kickoff will be after, uh, after I recorded this message, but probably prior to the pod getting posted, but it's the Hurricanes and Blues. In Australia, the Reds edged out the Rebels 23-21, and the Brum Brumbies are playing the Waratahs in the second match. Now, I'm not huge on reading the stats line. Highlights are okay. I don't mind them, but I just really want to watch these matches. Rugby Pass is streaming games live, and they're also posting recorded ones, but not in Canada and not in the U.S. Did somebody say VPN? <laughs> And lastly, just something else briefly here. The 10th Rugby World Cup is happening in France in 2023. You all know this. The schedule is up now. Two years in advance. That's a lot of planning and prepping. Big kicker is the opening match. Host France is squaring off against New Zealand at Stade de Francais. And incorporated for this, uh, for this tourney are those new safety guidelines that World Rugby is putting forth. New player safety laws will be in effect. The minimum five days rest between games. Still seems low, but it's a start. Squads increased to 33 participants. And these both, both of these rules are in hopes to optimize recovery and preparation and improving on-field performances. All right, Rugby Canada, we got two years to improve and qualify and do some damage. And saying that, we're now going to talk with Kingsley Jones, Rob Halley, 
Canadian teams, men's coaches. Let's go. All right. So Canadian Ruck welcomes back head coach of Team Canada, Kingsley Jones, and he's brought along Rob Halley with him. Uh, and these guys uh, are going to hopefully lead Canada to some glory here in the next few years. Uh, guys, welcome. Uh, thanks for joining me on the Canadian Ruck. Pleasure. Thanks, Jamie. All right, so let, let's jump, jump right in. I know it's a little ways out, but I think there's some people that are still interested in finding out what happened at the November camp. There's a three-week process. What, uh, what strengths do you guys see your team bring into the table over the next few years? Uh, I'll kick it off, and Rob can maybe talk to the tactical and technical of what he saw, but for us, it was a critical, uh, critically important camp. You know, not, not, being have any, uh, not being able to have any time with our players uh, through the process of the last season, obviously the circumstances we find ourselves, it was really important that we get together as a group. Of course, uh, some overseas players weren't able to, to get involved in the camp, but, you know, there's issues around quarantine. All having said that, Rob came in and done his two weeks admirably. Uh, and he's done another two weeks right now over in Toronto. So fair play to him, uh, hats off. And that's a bit of a challenge, particularly for our professional players. So we didn't, we didn't bring those guys in, obviously. Um, but the domestic domestic guys came in and showed uh, tremendous commitment to the cause. You know, there was obstacles in our way. There's lots of different restrictions. But actually, um, you know, when you haven't had something for a while, it just I think it made us all realize how much we missed it. And we just really got on with things. Um, you know, the, the actual attitude and approach from everybody, the coaches, the players were spot on. And um, so meaningful, so useful for us just to build some stuff around our culture just to, to, to talk about our targets and, uh, you know, our mission and vision. And, uh, you know, also around, um, uh, obviously, a, an opportunity for Rob, particularly, to see some younger players, to see the players he hasn't seen at first hand. For us to have something to assess our players on, because obviously the most difficult challenges for us in terms of our depth charts and our pathways is knowing who is where at the moment. And as I said, not playing rugby for a year is a very difficult one. So looking forward to the kickoff of the MLR. I hope it helps prepare our players for, 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 for their preseason they're currently in. Um, but yeah, it was a huge success um, as far as we can be concerned with no, no hiccups, no uh, you know, scares in terms of COVID symptoms. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a super positive. We had two scrimmages out here uh, players applied themselves really well. And some really some really good performances from some younger players as well. Uh, Mason Flesh, to mention one, really put his hand up. You know, he got called into it a little bit later in the in the in the selection process. And uh, wow, you know, him along with a couple of other younger guys, really impressed. Awesome. So Rob, what about the technical aspect and the new players that you were seeing? What did you think? Well, and new coaches, to be honest, James. Uh, look personally uh, from my perspective it was just good to be back coaching again uh, it was good to meet the people that I probably had been in communication on Zoom in fairness to how Kingsley had organised it we had a number of Zoom sessions uh, back in you know as early as August August and September in terms of preparation and hoping that the camp would go ahead so in terms of the, the organisation and the communication, I think that sort of sound, set the foundation and really gave us, uh, as, a, as a coaching team, a really solid platform uh, to actually then arriving out in Canada was, for me, uh, was the nuts and bolts to it, uh, Jamie, to be honest, because I was meeting players for the first time. So as coaches, you always believe in terms of uh, the players are an end product of the competition that they're involved in. And I think from the outset, speaking to Kingsley and coming over to uh, be involved with Rugby Canada, the involvement with Toronto Arrows and seeing the number of Arrows players involved in Rugby Canada and also actually to get up to speed with uh, the Pride uh, and the Academy, uh, which obviously, uh, you know, Jamie and Phil uh, are doing so much good work with. And then just to see that competition, just to see a game, I think the players and the coaches were excited to be involved in the first game. And then obviously coming to the technical and tactical issues of the improvements, we were able to see that difference between the first scrimmage and the second scrimmage. So I think there were a lot of boxes that, I don't like saying ticked, but... 
I think we we learn a hell of a lot of information from seeing players. Personally, I did at uh, first sight, working with them, how they learn, how they communicate their skills and actually enjoying coaching rugby and forgetting how how lucky we are to be involved in a game that we all love. I think that's fair. I think, uh, I, I know I, I had chatted with a few players after the camp and they were just excited to be able to, to train with people again and be on the pitch with people again with their teammates. Um, but, you know, you, you, you make kind of an interesting point. A lot of the guys, some of the guys couldn't make it because they were, you know, international. They were playing in France or England or what have you. But what does that say to the, the culture of the team? All these guys like a Cole Keith driving 20 hours or more from, you know, or however far it is from him to get from New Brunswick to, to out West and the guys coming up from the States. And how does that bring, bring this country together as a team for you guys? What does that say to you about these players? Well, I just well, think, go so on, just on yeah, the back yeah. of what Rob said, I'll jump in quickly, is the fact that it shows, it shows how much we miss um, the, our game, you know, when we, as I say, we love the game. And uh, it's tough not being able to coach it, but not being able to play it. I really empathise with the players because you know, I think I had one injury of about nine months while I was playing. I was very lucky I didn't miss many seasons, but these poor chaps are missing two or three seasons of their of their rugby career, possibly. You know, so I think they all are, are they all get that, and uh, they, they they quite they question of the Canadian guys. That sorry, I've never questioned the commitment of the Canadian guys though in terms of their work ethic, and they will. It's been fantastic since I've been here. You know from taking 33 hour trips to play Uruguay away without a murmur, you know, about the travel, uh, those sorts of things, you know, they, they, they get on with it. They're a great group. Rob, what were you, uh, if you were, what well, you were going to say there, sorry, I interrupted. Yeah. Sorry, mate. Uh, to, to be honest, Jamie, I think for us as coaches as well, and, and particularly myself is how players are motivated. And, and, and I think, you know, Kingsley one afternoon, we run a motivational session with all the players and, you know, back in probably a tier one country, whether that's New Zealand, uh, you know, Wales or Scotland and England, that, you know, majority of those players from the academy, they've got one sole goal, and that is to play for their country. Obviously, with Canadian players, it's far different. They're involved in family businesses, they're doing master's degrees, they're in college. And, you know, they're trying to do a number of other things outside of rugby to so see that commitment within our camp in actually improving them, whether it's technically or tactically. The commitment to be there alone was fantastic. And, and I think that, you know, I tried to ask a number of, uh, you know, former Canadian players before coming over to Rome, Rugby Canada. And they almost said that, that they're similar to the Welsh culture in terms of how hard they work and the energy, the enthusiasm, I'm sure Kings, you would agree, you know, they, in, t in terms of the games, it was no one watching, it was just the coaches, and the energy and the enthusiasm in the games and the scrimmages was just unbelievable, and uh, certainly I learned a lot about, uh, you know, the Canadian culture, and in particular those players that played, uh, you know, well, played and trained for, it was nearly three weeks, Kings, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So it must have been nice too, as coaches and Kingsley, you've been with the, with the team for, for a little while now, and Rob, it was your first venture, but it must have been nice as a positive to actually see these guys fresh, you know, not not nicked up from tournaments or match play. Like, you get to see them at probably at their full strength. Does that is... Uh, yes, guess... It's a fair point, Jamie, because obviously we, we, we often, uh, before a camp is announced, you're wondering who's going to make it. There'll be three drop out before the camp because they've been injured the previous weekend. The physio room wasn't too full, um, so it wasn't a sap on the resource. You know, some of those restrictions, like Rob mentioned, we couldn't. You know, we had a we had we had a a gathering of uh, fifty people. Uh, we had to limit that, of course. So any coaches or anyone during the scrimmage piece, because we needed a doctor at the scrimmage piece and we needed physiotherapists. So it's quite funny. I mean, some of the coaches had to sit in this building and watch it through a live feed uh, the scrimmage. So. You know, that's how serious we were with that side of things. Um, again, everyone just got on with it. But, um, no, you know, like you say, I think... Um, I'm sorry, Jamie, I lost your question. <laughs> I forgot where I went off. It's time about players being fresh. I like that, Jamie. You get, so you get old age, that is, Jamie. That's very much old age. <laughs> yes, you get yeah. everyone, right? 
He, he's is. probably cutting his own hair now too, right? Saving the <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely right. Thirty dollars a month that is in my pocket. I'm I'm going to do that for the rest of my days. Um, no, sorry, yeah. So the players were fresh, and of course, but there's the other side of that. I just mentioned before you had Rob is is that we have to be careful, of course, introducing them. We said we played two scrimmages, and they were at the at the back end of the camp. Uh, it was important that we do a return to play protocol, return to contact, and there were still restrictions around all of those things as well at the, at the outset of it. But um, no, the guys were you know, chomping at the bit, like you say, to, to get out and get uh, get at each other. That's awesome. Um, one thing I've always respected about the Welsh culture is how much you love rugby and how important it is in, in society. What are, I guess, in Canada, it's completely different in the fact that we're such a large physical, physical country, um, physically dimension. What are some areas of weakness that we can work on that, you know, propels us forward that you saw, I guess, at camp? Like, are there, are there things that we can work on? I know we've got players in the MLR. We've got some players overseas. How do we, how do we I guess, take that number 23 ranking and slowly move back up in the world stage? Well, hopefully, you know, in terms of, like, rugby is a number one sport in many other tier one countries. And obviously, Canada is not. Uh, obviously, that can it, is it ice hockey is the number one sport? Am I right there? Yeah, am I right? No, oh, I got something right anyway. Uh, anyway, uh, and I think that it's technical and tactical that a lot of these players, in terms of uh, you know, improving their skills, and you know, as I mentioned earlier, Jamie, about the competition that, that they play in, they're playing in an MLR which has improved season on season. I got no doubt there will be another improvement this season, uh, and I just think players need to play in the best competition which is available and then play in, uh, you know, particularly those players from the age of 18 to 23. And that's why I mentioned earlier, both Phil and uh, Jamie compared more with uh, the pride, uh, just exposing those players to, uh, you know, skills under pressure, uh, you know, when we train. So that skill is improved. So when it comes to a game that they're hopefully... Uh, become a little bit more automated in that skill, whether that's catching, passing, uh, kicking, tackling, you know, focusing on the basic fundamentals of the game. And I think that's that's a challenge for us as coaches where, you know, hopefully we can improve, uh, you know, Rugby Canada. And as you mentioned, the number 23, and, you know, we want to get up that uh, table as quickly as possible. Kingsley, anything to add? That's, that's really good. Yeah, one. I think, you know, Rob's, Rob's observations, he's, Pretty sharp guy, and he observes straight away. Is the biggest challenge is Jamie is, you know, in terms of um, the number one sport and the depth. You know, we, we obviously competition, lots of numbers, drive standards. The, comp the competition that they play in is a big factor, as I identified when I got here. Uh, Jamie, I signed in a contract extension, and I'll be honest, you if it wasn't for a triple bubble of, you know, the fact that um, we got a national academy now, place to teach players to become professional players. Hopefully. If, uh, a homing ground for these guys to be be able to go on into professional environments. We don't need, we haven't even got the opportunity to prepare these guys what to be, be to become professional sportsmen to give them a fair chance to go through the door somewhere. You know this does that. Then of course we have got the MLR. You know that that's that's ground that's world changing for for us. We've got sixty players now in that environment in, in the MLR, and I would say about fifty three of those players two years ago were holding down day jobs. They're now in a daily training environment, training to be rugby players. That is huge. I mean, it, it'd be nice if it was a lot more than, than, than 60. But, you know, um, and then, of course, um, the fact that the world rugby window has now changed to, to a July, August, September, October, window, November window for us. We align that with the MLR. It allows us to have a lot of time with our players. Um, one of Rob's, you, you can answer this question, but I'm sure from my time with Russia... And one of Rob's biggest challenges as an international coach is time with the players and lack of preparation. It's a real challenge. They go back to their clubs for a couple of weeks. They come back to you. They learn in two different things. They play in it. And that's a big challenge for players and, and, the, and the biggest challenge as an international coach. Your time with the players is critical. So by that window changing, it's going to allow our players to have hopefully a six-month se season with MLR and then the transition into international window, and then a rest period at the end. And that's going to give the USA and Canada a 
point of difference, actually, not only for the first time, possibly an advantage, because most other countries have the scenario we just we just talked about, you know. Anything like that, Rob? No, I agree with you, Kings. You know, uh, I think the challenge as coaches, Jamie, is, uh, you know, as an international coach, you just ha the players, when they leave the environment to go back to the club game, uh, you just have to remember when they come back in again, the likelihood they're not going to be in that same physical shape again or technical or tactical. So during that time you, that you spend in that international window, you know, they do generally get up to speed with the game, both technically, tactically and from a physical perspective. And then they go back to their club games. And, you know, uh, no doubt Kingsley was like this. I was like that. You actually relax as a bit of a player. You chill. And, you know, the pressure is not on the players as much as it would be in the international window. So when they come back in, you just have to remember as a coach that you're back to square one again, really. And then you keep working then on the fundamentals, you know, and, uh, you know, as coaches will tell you throughout the world that rugby is very simplistic. And as coaches, we make it very complicated sometimes and we try, uh, you know, it's about trying to remember that keep working on the fundamentals of the game and hopefully that will improve you when the pressure comes on like it normally does in the international game. So, just to add as well, Jamie, you know, I've been here, believe it or not, four years in October and uh, I know this, this is even harder to believe. I've even made friends and uh, outside of rugby and uh, Canadian friends and... Uh, Nice job. Guys, guys, even like some of my mates in their 40s and stuff. I mean, the amount of sports that you, that the Canadians have on, on offer to them. You know, where are you going next weekend? Oh, I'm skiing. Oh, I'm jet skiing. It's like seasonal. You know, oh, we, we, we're jet skiing. Oh, we're, we're snowmobiling this weekend. We're, and like these are my, I've had mates who are going to meet up for a, go for a hike. Oh, I can't make it. They're surfing at uh, Jordan River. We're all off surfing. And they're, they're not young guys, but I'm learning now about, you know, and that's why when Rob and I used to play against Canadian guys, we play with the Canadian guys, which a lot of them played in Wales and elsewhere in England and stuff. Those guys were so athletic at that time. We were, we were all amateurs then, and they, that's given the point of difference. We still have those people. We have big, strong men, fast men. We have round men that can scrummage. Um, but he has to say, Probably they don't focus and pin themselves on one sport in terms of rugby or whatever it might be as much as other countries because there isn't that professional pathway in some sports. And uh, you, you like, like I say, you play so many sports. But you, you make a really good point too, that well-roundedness, right? Like you have, you have a lot of players that have played, like rugby was their second or third sport growing up. And then they realize, wait a second, this, I really, I really love this game. That overall, you, you mentioned it, I guess, you know, when it was amateur, Canada did really well because they had really good athletes. But when it turned professional, that kind of, uh, you know, Canada and the U.S. kind of got pushed back because we didn't have professionalism here. How important, I mean, you talked a little bit about it before, but how, how much can you see the MLR strengthening Canada and, and the U.S. going forward? Like, is it, are we talking leaps and bounds? I mean, it's in the infancy, but how, how beneficial is that going to be down the road? Well, I think, I think it's, it's, like I say, it's a game changer, particularly being in the daily training environment. Rob's just spent two days, uh, day off today, but he's just, you know, Monday and Tuesday in with the arrows. I mean, that wasn't happening. You know, so it's, 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 it's obviously going to make them better, this, the, this strength conditioning. And then the depth, if you're a young, we t I think we mentioned this before, Jamie, but like I say, if I'm sat in the front room of my house watching a rugby match in Wales, and my little boy says to me, how do I play for Wales? I know the pathway. I know what he needs to do. Place for his local club. Hopefully he'll get into an academy at 16 age groups and then he's in a national academy and he's in a region. And if he's good in it, he makes that. He plays, plays for his country. We, we, I didn't know that pathway in Canada. What's the pathway? If, if you know, And that's really critical. There is a pathway now. Someone, you can watch Jamie Cudmore playing for Claremont in an Heineken Cup or you can't now, he's too old, but you can watch uh, Tyler Ardron. He, he could might still play. Uh, and, and you know the pathway now. There is a pathway. There's an academy with the Arrows. There's the Arrows as a professional team. There's, you know, is that the pathway into, into maybe you could argue a top 14 team or a, or a pro 14 team, etc. And uh, we've got a national academy as well. So our age groups have a, a void. We, we can fill that void now of 1920. You play for Canada, Canada age groups. So you play provincial level. 
where do you go if you want to pursue that? And now we've got, if you're in the top, we can't take more than, you know, 30 guys a year at the National Academy, but also the sevens pathway as well. You know, and that's a critical piece. There's 18 athletes currently in the sevens program, a full-time daily training environment. And the pleasing thing, I, you know, of November as well, Jamie was, we had nine, uh, nine guys put their hand up from the sevens program to come into our program to, tra to train and play. Seven of them came in and played. You know, and, and that's a transition we haven't had much of as well in the last few years. So the ability to transition between 15s and 7s, create that competition. Um, as, as long as there's a proper periodized plan for those athletes, they know which comps they're playing in um, at what times of the year. So that, that's all, you know, really come a long way in the last three or four years. And full credit to Rugby Canada for, for investing in the academies and, uh, you know, the 7s program, etc. You see, you can see options now for the younger guys is what you're saying, like the direction, the, the, the areas they need to go to improve and, and get noticed. Um, speaking of that, things like that, you, you, you talked about it before, like you had uh, a few players that couldn't make it to the November camp, you know, like a Tyler Arjun who's, who's overseas and et cetera. But how does that impact the direction that you want to take the team when you've got, you know, a lot of guys that are local. when I say local, they're in Canada or the States that can, it can show up often but then you bring back like a, you know, maybe a DTH a couple of years ago, you bring back a Tyler and things like that. How does that help with your direction? Like, does that change your philosophy on a game to game basis or as coaches, what do you think of those, I guess those aspects when you bring in players all the time? I think part of our problem might've been uh, Jamie in the last number of years is to build a team and cohesion, a Canadian way unfortunately our players again I think we mentioned they're really in a tough spot here they're in and living as professional players which is fantastic and uh, that's what we need but it's kind of counterproductive because when we need those players to be available for Canada they're under all sorts of pressures from the club not to make themselves available uh, or lose salary etc those are the sorts of things you I know happen so that has been a challenge but I think with the introduction of MLR with the introduction of the National Academy I think we, well, I know we, we need to really look at our model. And if I believe if players are not available for eight to 10 games per season for the national team, then it's going to work against them when it comes to 50-50 selections. Um, purely because of the cohesion piece, the continuity piece, it's a real challenge for, for players. What we've had is, and all understandably, I totally understand from the players' view, and something that was driven a little bit by, the, by our model, no professional domestic game locally, so what do we do? We encourage our players to go overseas, but then we don't get them back as much as we'd like. Um, but uh, I think if you look at any team at a World Cup that achieves, they've had a lot of caps by the time they get to a Rugby World Cup. You know, we, 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 we've got to ensure that's the case with us, that we've got a spine of our team that played together for consistent for all the fixtures through the season. Of course, we, you know, we pick a squad of 30, if we're going we're gonna to have a situation where we have 25 guys, possibly 20 guys playing in the MLR, and then a few guys from overseas. But I guess it's, it's up to them to be available as much as they can and for them to fit in to the culture and the, and the, and the ethos of the current other 25 players, if that makes sense, Jamie. Is the culture and ethos, is it coming from you guys or is that like team directed? How does that, how does that break down at the international level, like for Canada, for Wales or for a different country? Well, I'll let Rob talk to that because we did sure. some cultural stuff and uh, Rob led on it a bit as well in November. So, Rob, it's over to you. Beautiful. Yeah, I think it's so important, the, the culture within the environment. And ultimately, it has to come from the players, uh, Jamie. I, I think that obviously you can put tasks and situations in play whereby you feed off the players. I think they have to recognise their values and their culture and how they want to be seen on the field uh, from a behavioural perspective and off the field uh, from a behavioural perspective. And I think that we've done some really good work uh, in, in the November regarding identifying, you know, some values and some team culture, uh, what uh, the players, senior players uh, were identifying, what they want to see and everyone had a buy-in. Obviously some of those players were overseas, weren't there. So, you know, that's what Kingsley just mentioned in, or touched upon regarding, you know, that cohesion. And as Kingsley mentioned earlier, you know, spending time with the players is so valid from a coaching perspective and having them for a, a full training week or the two weeks leading up to an international game. And sometimes that's not always the case when, 
you know, players are playing, you know, outside of their country. Uh, they have issues, obviously, in every country in terms of IRB regs uh, and being available. But I think from a Rugby Canada perspective, uh, certainly with the Pride programme and the, obviously National Academy and in conjunction with the MLR and, and Toronto, you're creating some strength and depth and some competition, which ultimately then... You know, what you want to do is challenge players who are playing, you know, whether it's in the top 14 or other leagues in the world, that, you know, there are players, maybe younger players that you might decide to go with that actually are available week in, week out, buy into that culture and the cohesion and ultimately get the best out of the team. Now, that best might not be a result you know, you might have to take a hit or two, but in terms of next Rugby World Cup, two or three, two years, then hopefully that experience through training and playing, you might have a younger model, a younger, younger sort of player in terms of being able to perform at international rugby. And I think that's the challenge for us as coaches and players within Rugby Canada. I think that's really interesting what both of you guys say, that the philosophy of the culture, you know, kind of driven by the players. I'm sure there's things that you guys want to make sure that's included as well. And, you know, you, you, you kind of talk about that as well. But, uh, you know, it's different. Like I coach high school, I coach provincially. And when you're younger, a lot of the times you want it to be player driven, but a lot more of it has to come from the coach. But as you grow and you start playing international, um, those players know what it takes. And if they're not accountable they have to hold each other accountable. How much do you get, how much do you two as coaches uh, expect your players to hold each other accountable? Like, so that you're not constantly being the bad guy when you're on, you know, a three week trip and things like that. No, I think it's very important. I think we all hold each other to account. It's not just players. It's the whole group. We're all in it together. We create our own um, behaviors, our, our, what we expect from each other. And we try to live by those standards. And it's, it's really important. Uh, you know, a critical friend is someone who picks you up uh, and, and tells you that that's not what, we, what we're what we about. That's why, I mean, values and culture are so important, Jamie, that you set those out early. Rob did an exercise with the guys, basically talked around picking up, picking value selection of words amongst the 35 guys. Rob took those away. We came up with the, the most common values, shared values. We put a number of five on those values. And, uh, you know, one or two of those, I might have put slightly different. Um, but ultimately, it's what the majority of us thought uh, are our values and how we should be perceived and how we want to behave. And uh, it's up to us to, to, if there's one or two values that you don't agree with, that's okay. But, you know, we've got to try and live by the values of the group. The second thing we did, which Rob did, was uh, we put it to the players, which players in the room or people in the room display most of those characteristics uh, all of the time or most of the time. And through that process, we came up with, well, it was, Rob can talk to it more. I don't even know the numbers, to be honest, because Rob dealt with it. But there was five clear standout candidates that had a lot of the votes from the rest of the group as the five people they see as, um, as the, the, the people that display the behaviours that we want and values. So from that, of course, Jamie, you come up with a leadership group. And uh, that group you share a bit more with. They become almost like a part of the coaching staff um, but the, the, the balance of that has to be critical as well. They are still players, but if we want most things, most things, Jamie, in an environment in a tough week where somebody says, suggests we, we move a session or should we go and do some team building this date or we, we, we bring in those players and we meet with them. And what we did in November was at the end of every staff meeting, I say every, but almost every staff meeting, it was 10 minutes allotted to bring in the leadership group and we'd share with them what we just discussed and we'd pick up anything that was, you know, or, or ask them their opinions on anything we felt it affected them and the group. I, I really like that. Is Can you guys share what those terms were and what who those players were? Or is that like more in-house stuff? Rob's laughing a little bit there. Well, that's, uh, that's to, uh, I'll just say in terms of like from, from a coaching perspective, uh, you know, the coaching world, uh, you know, certainly change over the period of time as, as players change, become more professional uh, and they're getting used to be involved in professional environments where 
coaches are very humanistic and empowering players, but you have to make sure you empower the right players. And obviously you mentioned the word being accountable and accountable was one of those values. I think there's, you know, in the game of rugby, there's another number of policies which you have, whether that's from attack, defence, uh, tackle situation, counter-attack. But ultimately then as coaches, you're able to, as long as players recognise that they need to be accountable for parts of the game, then ultimately then you, you can make sure you're able to judge players on their performance through their accountability. So it, it works a full circle, Jamie, and I think that's how uh, certainly, you know, my coaching career has evolved over the last sort of 12 years. And I think that there is a saying in the coaching world, you're only as good as the players as a coach. And it's certainly having, you know, good good, good pay people make good players. And the people I met in, in the November camp and now in Toronto, they're really good people. And, you know, hopefully uh, as coaches, we're able to challenge them in an environment which has got its honesty, it's got its accountability about work ethic. And if we can work as hard as we talk about it, uh, and, and Kingsley talks about, uh, you know, being good at things that require no talent. And if we can work work on those elements of the game and fix a couple of technical and tactical, Canada will be, uh, you know, certainly climbing that table sooner rather than later. I love the positivity from both you guys. It's awesome. Let's take a look. Uh, I, there hasn't been as much talk in the last week or so, but the uh, proposed mini Rugby World Cup, uh, Rugby World Cup that Australia was kind of bandying about, where they were talking about on the heels of uh, the Tri Nations or the Rugby Championship or something, maybe having uh, a mini World Cup where they've invited other clubs in, other countries in. Um, is, some, is that something that Canada would even be able to entertain financially? you know, maybe you're playing Australia, but maybe you're also just playing, you know, maybe you're playing the Waratahs or something like that. Is that something that could do, be done or is that too expensive at this juncture where there hasn't been any internationals at all in the last year plus? Well, I think it's a little bit above my pay grade. Uh, it's <laughs> one for Alan Vance and I believe, you know, and, and uh, you know, that sort of question. But I'll be honest, I know just from my rugby connections that obviously we, you know, I speak to people in New Zealand, Australia all the time and there is a need, they feel there's a need for Pacific competition. And uh, in terms of finances, of course, we can't afford to fund something like that, but there would be external funding for those types of competitions. You know, they'd bring in sponsorship. And uh, of course, Canada would love to jump on the back of that. that was, that's gonna, it's gonna be a tough, tough contest for us to be playing in those types of fixtures. But ultimately, it's gonna hopefully make us better, you know? And uh, I don't know, if I'm on the same page as you, Jamie, what you're referring to, but I have you talking about know, Japan, you know, all along that Pacific, Japan and the, and the Pacific Island teams and New Zealand and Australia, why not USA and Canada all along that Pacific uh, sort of rim down from north to south? Mm -hmm. That'd be great. So it's something I know that Rugby Canada would be keen on. We're obviously, we've got to look at the new competition structures for us all the time. You know, the ARC is gone. Um, so what is in line for us? There are tentative talks going on that I'm always consulted on, um, but really they're all in their infancy. Um, and, you know, as we stand right now, until we get through this uh, or see some light at the end of the tunnel, I think we thought we'd see some light at the end of the tunnel through December and with the vac vaccine, but uh, there's still a long way to go, isn't there? So we, we're just waiting on that sort of thing. You and I talked about that before too, about, you know, the old Churchill Cup that used to happen with Canada and the States and a few other countries. And, you know, I think I, I even threw out the idea of having like a, an America's tour, similar to a Lions tour, where you, you know, try and, you know, group up Canada, US, Brazil and Argentina or something like that. And, and uh, you know, go on a barnstorm somewhere and play for a few weeks in Europe or whatever. But uh, I, again, I think that's, it's a lot of money. It'd be really cool if, if something like that could happen. All right, so gents, we're gonna get a couple of questions left, but before we do, we're gonna switch to the uh, the little eight question quiz as to who is more Canadian. Huh. So they're all multiple choice. Um, if I was a betting man, I would give a little bit of leeway here to Kingsley because he's been in the country a little bit longer, but Rob, we'll see if we can help you out, all right? So just pay attention to the cues. Okay. All right, you guys ready? Go on, yeah. we'll give it a whirl. 
Question one. So there's multiple choice. So I'll read the question. And then I'll give you four options to choose from. Question one. What is Putin? Is it craft beer? Is it a cappuccino from Tim Hortons? Is it fries, gravy, and cheese? Or is it a hockey player from the 70s? It's fries, gravy, and cheese. Rob or Kingsley, what do you think? Same answer as Robert. I've, uh, I've observed people eating it, but I've never actually eaten it. I will be honest, but uh, it's, I will it's absolutely it. delicious. <laughs> can, can we, because because I know, I think, oh, I, do, I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't say that. Can we have a supplementary question to that part B? Uh, I don't have, do you have a question to ask? So uh, if, if you had to translate poutine, what would it mean? Cheese and gravy, I think, or fry. I'm, I'm not sure because my French isn't that strong, but it's, I think it's like, I think it basically just means fries, gravy, and cheese. I, I, I thought it's meant it's like a messy, it's a mess. It could be that as well. I don't like cheating. Hey, Siri, what is poutine oh. in English? <laughs> Siri. It's not the enemy. Didn't hear me properly. <laughs> All right. Question two. What is Canada's only bilingual province? Is it A, Ontario, B, New Brunswick, C, British Columbia, or D, Quebec? I think it's New Brunswick. New Brunswick. What do you, what do you think, Rob? I agree with Kingsley. Well done, guys. Look at you two go. Two for two. I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> question three what is canada's national sport is it a hockey b lacrosse c curling d none of the above or e a and b a and b a and b hockey and lacrosse that's your final answer well yeah. done good job guys well done you guys are that was, that was a close one I actually, oh, no. knew, I actually knew I knew that one, so I was confident, confident on that one. All right. Uh, question four. What is Canada's biggest export? Is it A, maple syrup, B, crude oil, C, trees, or D, hockey players? Crude mm. oil. B. Crude oil. Okay, that was quick. What about you, Kingsley? Well, I don't think we export trees, so I'll say crude oil. <laughs> it is it's crude oil true we do export trees we do but not we do know, maple, not syrup, ma maple syrup will be quite high wouldn't it i think it is quite high as well yeah it's a good question actually that's a, that's a tricky one that's a tough one all right the last few questions all have to do with rugby canada and uh all of them are with the men's program so we're going to go back in the 1991 rugby world cup canada lost in the quarterfinals 29 to 13 to which nation france Wales, New Zealand, South Africa. I remember it because the game before was the big fight, wasn't it, against South Africa? Yes, so the quarterfinal was the quarterfinal was New Zealand. New Zealand, Rob. Our best ever score against yeah, New Zealand as New well. New Zealand. I, I can remember uh, who was a scrum half who played that day it was Morgan uh, Morgan yeah. Williams because Morgan. So, yeah. Morgan, Morgan was in Cardiff with us when we were in Cardiff, uh, Jamie. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Awesome. All right. Who has the most tries for the men's team all time? Is it A, Taylor Paris, B, James Pritchard, C, DTH Van der Merwe, or D, Winston Stanley? That's a I'll tough let one. Rob go first. I'll let Rob go first because I know the answer. Okay. But... Bring that DTH. You're going DTH? Yes. Right on to Rob. Well done. Well done. Thank you, Kings. <laughs> All right. Two left. You guys are tied. This is this is impressive. I'm really impressed here. All right. Who is Rugby Canada's most capped player? Is it Al Sharon, Aaron Carpenter, Winston Stanley, or Nick Blevins? Rob, let's go back to you first. Oh, you've chucked it there. <laughs> uh you coach with them right now. Yeah, it's Carps, is it? It is Carps. Yeah. And, Kingsley, uh, you knew that one, right? Yeah, it's Aaron. I know that one. He played his last game for Spain. It was actually his last game for Canada. It was his first game with me and his last game with me in our victory over Spain. And uh, caps. Do you know, Kings? How many caps, James? Probably 81, James. I think. 81, I think. I think it's 80 uh, or 81, yeah. 
last one. Who has the most caps at captain for Canada? Is it A, Tyler Ardron, B, Al Sharon, C, Gareth Reese, D, all of the above, or E, both B and C? Can you go through them again, Jamie, please? Yep. First one is Tyler Ardron. B is Al Sharon. C is Gareth Reese. D is all of the above. And E, Rob, E is B and C. So it's Al and Gareth is B and C, yeah? Yeah. 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 I'll go uh, with that one. I think they each had 25 as captain. Did they? Yeah. I I didn't know the answer. Um, I, yeah, yeah. Gareth. Sorry, I didn't know the answer, but I'm going to guess that one. B and guess, C. Yeah. yeah. That's B a good guess. Yeah, it was, it's Alan, Alan Gareth, both at 25. I think Tyler is pushing 20, though, right now. Well, that's okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for those. They were they were fun. You guys, like, eight for eight. That was impressive. I was, <laughs> like, like, citizenship cards are coming in the mail. That's that's how impressive that was. <laughs> I wouldn't get eight, out of eight, eight back in Wales. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, uh, most of our listeners are just listening and they're not watching the YouTube play of this. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I really did know about five of them. The rest I was get, I would have been guessing. So yeah, it's not bad. Yeah. All right. So, Rob, talk to us about your role specifically with the arrows. I know it's a new venture for you. You're in Toronto right now. You're 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 saying it's pretty cold compared to what you used to. But <laughs> what are you, what are you looking forward to this year with Toronto Arrows? And you know, subsequently, your you know your temporary move to Atlanta at the same time. Well, uh, one to be successful. Uh, Probably working with the players who obviously uh, who are currently in Rugby Canada and also working with the players in terms of maybe the tr transitional players who might have a future on that pathway, which uh, Kingsley spoke about earlier. And I think that, you know, talking about working with not only with the players, but with the coaches as well, uh, you know, in fairness to Kingsley and Rugby Canada you know, back in November, both uh, Peter, Peter Smith and Aaron Carpenter came in as coaches, uh, along with Mark Winnicott as a manager, and sort of got to know them. Uh, and particularly from a coaching perspective, it was good to work with both with Carps and Peter back then. And obviously now getting familiar with how Toronto Arrows go about, uh, you know, their business in terms of their coaching and preparing us team, and hopefully adding had him adding value to the environment, working with the coaches, uh, and hopefully uh, from Rugby Canada's perspective, working with those players who probably come into the window, we won't have that much time to work with in terms of uh, the summer internationals. And, uh, you know, I think that give, hopefully gives us an edge uh, and gives us, uh, you know, better preparation time really when we do have them. Awesome. So you got a good coaching staff there. You got a good, good squad. You got a lot of key young players. You got a lot of strength there. So it's going to be interesting. Like you guys, I think they started five and zero last year before COVID shut them down, and the year before, I think they they made it to the semifinal. So um, that's that's right, Jamie. You know, I I I look back at the games uh, that they played. Uh, you know, obviously last year, and I think that they won quite a significant in terms of on being on the road. I think the biggest challenge for everyone in, in the Arrows is really, you know, you mentioned about going down to Atlanta. Uh, so it's, you know, time away from the families. Uh, some have got young children and that's going to be a challenge in itself and keeping players, you know, uh, busy throughout that working week, you know, in terms of their downtime and making sure that, you know, that, it's the focus or the mental part of the game is making sure we are probably in the right space uh, and keeping our players sort of on us throughout the week and, and making sure in terms of travel and, you know, hopefully making sure we're all safe, which is, you know, tough when you are traveling and was our first three games, one's in Atlanta, Utah, and then up to Washington, D.C., Oh well, yeah, that'll be that'll be interesting. I, I imagine you guys are going to have lots of great protocols in place to make sure the guys are the guys are being smart and staying safe. Um, oh, one hundred percent, and that's the key, you know. And 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 that's uh, the challenge for everyone to make sure that we our environment is safe. It's a bubble, and uh, you know everyone 
is discipline within that uh, bubble as well. Yeah. Um, I, I think lastly here for me, from, uh, from both of you, I guess, how do you two plan on working together for the next few years with Canada? Like what's your, your relationship like and how can you two see each other, complement each other to help Rugby Canada grow? I think firstly, I'm really lucky to have some of Rob's experience, you know, um, and not not only that, I think the relationship that you you know and trust e each other is critical. Um, you know, Rob and I were lucky enough to play for Wales together. Rob was captain uh, in our time together. I was vice captain. I often captained the dirt track as a midweek. Um, and it was very much shared, to be fair, when... Rob, I don't, correct me if I'm wrong, you're wrong here, Rob, but I was captain of my club team for a number of years and I'm not sure how much captaincy Rob did. He had done some, Rob, I believe, but not a huge amount. And I remember a conversation with the Wales coach about me and Rob, Rob's the captain, but me to support him as well. And uh, I felt I did that. We worked well together. You know, if Rob dropped out, I would end up captain and things like that. We worked well together. I think uh, that's critical that you know and trust each other and you have some shared experiences. We've obviously been co. We've, I don't know if you know this, Rob, but uh, I was told in '97 actually that um, the Welsh Rugby Union had myself, Rob Owley, and David Young targeted to be the Wales coaches in 2019. That's how much planning they were doing at the time. That's I was cool. told that I was told that by a, uh, a Welsh development or someone who was in higher hierarchy in the Welsh Rugby Union a few years later. Um, what I'm telling you that for is because. We were very, we were both supported by the WRU in our coaching development in terms of being fast tracked. Uh, when I was at Sale Sharks, Welsh Rugby Union would send a coach development guy for to spend uh, a week at the start of the season, a week at the end of the season, assessing us, helping us. And I remember actually sitting in a car with him one day up in Manchester, and Rob, he was on the phone to Rob, who was at the Blues at the time. Um, if you like, we were the, we were kind of his. Uh, well, we were the targeted guys they were trying to fast track. And um, through that, the, I think we have a lot of philosophies and understanding, not the same necessarily all of it, but a lot of philosophies and understanding has come through from the last 25 years being, being mentored by similar people, if not the same people, and also um, playing together and knowing each other. So it's got a huge experience, you know, high level experience is the key thing in terms of international rugby, tier one rugby. And also he knows what it takes to win. He knows the winning formula. So um, hopefully we can implement that into Russia, to Canada. It's obviously not as straightforward as uh, bringing a template. It's different. It's totally different. There'll be a lot of learning for Rob, as much experience as he got on the different challenges. But uh, I know that, you know, in terms of his appetite and commitment, he's fully up for the challenges and he's looking forward to it, I'm sure. So you can ask him a bit more. But that's how I see it. And I think me being able to empower someone and trust somebody is something I've needed for the last three years. I've been pretty much, you know, direct in a ship with no continuity in terms of my support. And it's been a real hard challenge for me. I mean, I've coached every aspect of the game with this group at some point. Uh, and I need to have the people that can deliver those, those messages better than me. And I know Rob can. So uh, it allows me to concentrate on the culture and everything else that goes with the job as well as a head coach. Awesome. Rob, do you care to elaborate or... Well, <laughs> I can't say much more than that like, in terms of the trust and knowing Kingsley. And as long as I've known Kingsley, and I think that, uh, you know, he certainly understands the game, uh, you know, and his experience, which he's had, he's had far more experience, uh, you know, in terms of as a head coach, uh, whilst I've been an assistant coach in a tier one country for a period of time, uh, I think there is a blend there that the blend that will work. And I think that's then built on, uh, you know, Kingsley mentioned about the honesty and the trust. Uh, and the one thing as well is certainly uh, as, as well as I know Kingsley, I know I can challenge Kingsley and he knows that he can challenge me. And the one thing which what I would say, whether that's a disadvantage or not now, Jamie, is that probably we haven't got an ego uh between us and i think whether you need someone in in a coaching team with an ego i'm not too sure but that ego allows us to challenge each other uh that there will be obstacles and no with, with no ego then you're able to get over those challenges because you're able to say do you know what kings you were right there you were spot on 
you know, and we go with that. And I think that it's not about Kingsley. It's not about me. And, you know, I, I hate models within world rugby where there's a lot of pressure put on the captain or the lot of pressure put on the head coach because ultimately you're all accountable and there's ways and means of cutting that piece of cake and sharing, you know, that piece of cake. And I think that that cake will be shared between us and, uh, you know, taking that responsibility and accountability between us all. And, uh, you know, ultimately Kingsley will have that final say, uh, yes or no. And whether that's myself, uh, and, and the other coaches, you know, we'll go with that, you know, and we'll have our arguments and discussions behind closed doors in those four walls. But when we come outside of that, we're as one. And if the, if the players will see, will see that, that makes us much stronger as a group as coaches and as a group as Rugby Canada. That's awesome. I think you guys are on the same page, but you both talk about, you know, questions and, and uh, maybe not agreeing at times, but I think... I think at the end of the day, if everybody thinks the exact same way, then nobody's really thinking. So you guys can challenge each other by looking at things from different perspectives and behind closed doors and then coming out with that unified front. It's it's going to be great for our program. It's going to be great for our country and it's going to be great for rugby all around. So that's awesome. Um, before we go, Just can you guys speak to add on the coaching? Sorry, I, I didn't know, but you know, Rob mentioned we had three, three former international, uh, well, three former Canadian captains in our coaching staff, you know, in Phil, Mac, Jamie and, and Carps. And uh, that's, that's great as well. And, and having that to understand the culture more than we do, although we're bang on eight out of eight, out of eight in the quiz, you know, more me and Rob do our stuff. It's actually critically important as well, our identity and, uh, you know, the chance of November for Rob to work with, because Jamie will be assisting us as a forwards coach and hopefully we'll attach Phil and Carps when available with the arrows. So, we really want to develop those guys as well. So, you know, for those guys to learn off Rob and hopefully off me, then that's that's huge as well. And who knows how long we'll be here, but hopefully and if it, our legacy will be that there's Canadians coaching at the national level, um, you know, and been exposed to professional rugby uh, as players and as coaches, and it'll leave them, give them a great opportunity to be the national team coach this year, you know. That's awesome. And don't forget, you can always, you both have my email and cell number. You can always give me a call if you need a hand, right? With some, uh, with some scrum half sure. work, right? Of course, Jamie, Mr. Moon. That's no right. problem at all. <laughs> there we go. Mo Mo hey, Mooney could fight, but he couldn't kick or pass. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to comment on my skills. Anymore. He could dive pass. Rob's jealous. He's just given up. Rob took the jersey <laughs> off him. Just because Rob couldn't dive pass for the first five years of his career. And he learned that dive pass he was in. <laughs> so I, I'm assuming, Jamie, your dive pass was, you know, it was a 9.9 .9 then. It was spot on. Uh, okay. <laughs> it, it's gone. It's gone by the wayside. I, I don't I don't think I've seen anybody do a dive pass since like 98, though. So I'm not sure. <laughs> you get marked down if you're on the floor, Jamie. You can't be diving on the floor. You're trying to keep players <laughs> off the floor. <laughs> Times have changed. <laughs> hey, Grant, how are you? Just been on with Jamie. Hope it's all going well at Beckham and Rovers, if I've said that right. Yeah. Good luck to you. Nice to meet you one, one day, someday soon, perhaps. Grant, uh, heard a lot about you. Obviously, on the rock with Jamie, uh, heard you're doing lots of good work. Keep doing what you're doing. Uh, if you need any help, uh, I'll give Jamie my number and I will be right over to help you. You take care, pal. All the best. Awesome. Thanks very much, guys. Um, so anyway, thanks very much for joining us on the Canadian Rock. Really appreciate it and looking forward to seeing Canada back on the pitch and what you guys are doing at the helm for them. So cheers and thanks for your time. Thanks, Thank Jamie. You. Thanks very much, coaches. And I, I do have to say, if I worked at uh, Customs and Immigration, you two would definitely both be full-on Canadian citizens after acing that quiz eight for eight. Uh, very impressed, uh, Kingsley. I knew you would do well. You've been here a couple of years, but Rob, like you're just ingrained into our culture. Uh, so good on you both. Uh, well done. Very well done. Stay safe prepping with Canada and obviously Rob with you for the arrows, especially as you get to, you're moving down to Georgia here eventually to play, uh, to play your home games out of Atlanta. Uh, coming up soon, we got a few on task. Marissa Pache, she'll be next. Uh, as I mentioned before, she's a chief marketing officer for World Rugby. Following that is Stephanie and Hans de Goody. Uh, as far as I know, the only couple that have Captain Canada internationally at rugby and I think in any sport correct me if I'm wrong 
uh, after that, we've got Bobby Ross. Bobby and I are going to be chatting next week over my March break. That'll be an interesting one. Nick Blevins, we're still trying to queue up a time to chat, but his will be coming up so, uh, shortly as well. And of course, we've got a host of others. So lastly, just want to say thanks to everybody for listening. Uh, but more importantly, keep spreading the rugby where if you hear one of, the, one of these pods that you enjoy, pass it on. Send it to your, send it to your buddies to uh, allow other people to hear these great, fascinating stories about some of our great athletes, great coaches. I mean, we got Kingsley and Rob, two Welsh uh, gentlemen, two Welsh legends here that are running our men's program. Uh, make sure people are hearing this. It's great for us. It's great for Canadian rugby. As always, got to say thanks to my son, Rylan, for supplying us with our tunes. Rylan's my 12-year-old. He, he decided to make some intro and outro music for me with his laptop, so it's pretty cool. Uh, as always, feel free to request topics for future podcasts, whether it's guests, whether it's questions, whether it's ideas. At Carnival Dom on Instagram, message me with an idea about uh, maybe having some fans on once in a while to talk about a few things. So that's something that I'm looking into as well. Lastly, this is Jamie. And until next time, I want you to stay safe, stay healthy, stay sane. Most importantly... Keep on rocking.